Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We are talking all about monarchs with Brody Dunn, but before we get to Brody, we have got to introduce your co-host with me every single week because I can't do this by myself, folks. I got to bring my my bug guy in here, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. I'm excited. We get to talk about bugs again today. So I, I knew you would be. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would love this. We've been talking about insects for a couple of weeks now. You know, last week we were talking about fall flowering plants and we're all like, these are all good pollinator plants. And so we're putting that twist on things right now. Um, so uh, Ken, in terms of monarch butterflies, um, I mean, this is what I have used all the time with extension to teach people about you know, insects and insect life cycles. Is uh, the same ring true for you? So yeah, sometimes when you go to, to classrooms, especially uh, talk with kids, um, either I or, or my kids have talked about their teachers using them, talk about the life cycle. And I think every once in a while they've reared them. Um, either monarchs or painted ladies are another common one uh, that people will use uh, for that life cycle. Yeah. I've done the same with my kids and it, it's, it's a lot of fun too, to do at home and just to, uh, point out that you know it, it's a learning experience for them um and not only do you see a lot of successes with rain butterflies you also see some tragedies too so i think we're going to get into a lot of that uh, today with uh brody so uh you know we might as well bring him in here as we're talking about monarch butterflies uh, brody welcome to the show hey chris i'm happy to be here so brody can you tell us uh, uh who you are and, and what what are you doing here uh, with the U of I Extension, but also University of Illinois. Yeah, sure thing. Um, well, like Brody Dunn is my name. Uh, for Extension, I'm a visiting Extension Outreach Associate. And what I'm doing is I'm coordinating statewide pollinator programming for Extension. And I'm also doing some work uh, for the Department of Entomology, the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So, and, and Brody, we are really happy to have you here. I, I, I was fortunate enough to get to know you as you were applying for this job. And we're all like, we got to hire this guy. Um, so, I mean, you have done some pretty interesting research. So you are working with Dr. Nick Sider on cover crops. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I was working with, uh, in, in Dr. Sider's lab, looking into the uh, pests and beneficial insects in uh, soybean and soybeans after a cereal rye cover crop has been planted. And I was also looking into the bird community that, um, that was in there too. And, and you also were the, the president of the Champaign uh, County Audubon chapter, is that correct? Uh, it, it was correct. It was correct until, uh, I think la until I needed to graduate, yep. at which point <laughs> I, I had to set that one aside. Um, too, too, much, too much work on to, to have to be able to do both. Oh yeah. Well, well, I mean, we were talking, we were talking about you, Brody, and we were saying this guy gets it. He gets the connection between the, the circles of ecology out in wildlife, the insects and birds, and then go higher up the food chain. So um, we're, we're really happy to have you here. And we're going to talk about I pollinate here in a little bit. But right now, let's dive into monarch butterflies. So, um, OK, we have I, I have to ask you this, Brody, everyone knows about monarch butterflies, I suppose, and everyone talks about them, everyone's worried about them. Why are they so special? Well, who, why should we care so much about monarch butterflies? Why should we care so much about monarch butterflies? Yeah. Well, yeah. Monarch butterflies are, I, it's, it's impossible to deny that they're, that they're beautiful, right? that they're not beautiful, right? They're, they're wonderful insects. They're also just deeply fascinating. Uh, you know, they have this this huge epic long migration that they that they undergo. You know, mo most insects that you see out there, they're overwintering some way. You know, so the the generation that you're seeing come up in spring, you know, it, it was laid as an egg in the fall, right? And for a monarch, the monarchs that you're seeing in the spring, it, it's it's not like that. You know, the monarchs have this these four gen four generations a year, and you know the this first generation they come up. Uh, part way into North America, second generation keeps pushing forward up, up, and the further, you know, further up into Canada. And then the third and fourth generations are moving their way back down. And they go all the way back down to Mexico, where they overwinter. So it's the offspring 
of that overwintering population that are that are actually making that next uh, making the migration northwards. Which I, I think that's just fascinating. It's this huge, big, long migration. Normally, we think of birds when we you know are talking about these continental huge migrations, and here is this insect, this little tiny thing that's making that huge journey. I think that's just fascinating. I think it's one of the biggest reasons that it captivated us. I, I think it's that hero's journey, right? It's like Luke Skywalker going from the desert to Tatooine, going over, trying to get to Alderaan, can't make it, gets the Death Star instead, and then winds up. The, yeah, it's that hero's journey, right? Um, I couldn't have said it better like myself, Wars. Chris. That's exactly. perfect. Yeah, exactly. And I know Ken is loving this too. So uh, <laughs> we do celebrate Star Wars Day here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Also, some of the needs of monarch butterflies, um, you know, when we think about, you know, this is the very fascinating creature, it does have some specific needs in terms of being part of its life cycle. So, um, Brody, could you talk just a, a bit about, you know, as we walk through the life cycle of the monarch from egg, caterpillar, pupa, adult, I mean, what are, what are the, what does this insect need in that, those life stages? Well, they, they need the same thing that everybody else needs. They need, uh, they need shelter and they need food, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that, that's a, a big issue for monarchs is that, uh, you know, it's a big, big issue for not just monarchs, it's all pollinators, right? You know, we have this landscape that is increasingly divided up and increasingly, increasingly devoted towards really intensive agriculture where there's, there's no weeds, you know, it's, it's all ag, there's no weeds, there's no edge. Um, there's no habitat. So, you know, these uh, monarchs, they're, they're migrating and they have fewer and fewer uh, nectar resources, fewer places for them to stop and rest and fewer, uh, fewer places for them to be able to lay eggs. They, they're exclusive to, um, uh, mon or to, excuse me, milkweeds, right? So these monarchs are, are obligately, they, they must lay eggs on a milkweed. And there's, there's fewer and fewer stems of those milk, milkweed out there. And uh, that, that's a need that they have. All right, so you've mentioned some of the, the potential issues we've had with monarchs, uh, those populations declining with habitat loss. And we've heard a lot about the population decline, them becoming threatened, things like that. So for the habitat loss, what are some of those driving factors behind that? Yeah, I mean, one, one of the biggest uh, declines that we saw in monarch populations was almost certainly a result of, uh, you know, the, in the, uh, corn Belt, the upper Midwest, Midwest, you know, we, we have this, we got this corn that was resistant to glyphosate, right? And glyphosate we, is, is, you know, pretty relatively non-toxic, right? So you, you wouldn't think that it would necessarily pose a huge problem for monarchs. The problem is that that glyphosate just wiped out a ton of the floral resources that monarchs depended on. Also wiped out a ton of the, as I was talking about earlier, these this obligate plant that it has to have this milkweed just wiped out a ton of those milkweed plants. And, uh, you know, we're, we're I, I think we've finally reached the sort of bottom of that where we're no longer losing more milkweeds, uh, but we're, we're nowhere near the level of habitat that we used to have, you know, 20 years ago. So habitat is, is, is one of the biggest, where are some of the other, I guess, reasons we may be seeing those populations declining? Right. So, you know, the habitat is, is a really big one. And also those floral resources, the, you know, the ability for these monarchs to be able to migrate and have food on their way is, of course, huge. There's also some diseases that are out there. They're really hitting them hard. And uh, you especially see the, the you see these diseases emerge in uh, captive reared um, monarchs. But it, it's called OE, and I, I honestly I can't pronounce the name. It's a big long no Latin one can. name. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why they said that. They 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 don't want anyone to be. Yeah, able to they say they, it. Show, yeah. they just cut all the rest of it out. Just call we'll call it OE, and that's that's all it's going to be. Um, but yeah, it, it's and that's pretty devastating to them. It has a really high mor mortality rate, and it's at this point I think it's nationwide. It used to be isolated in certain spots, and now it's everywhere. Yeah, we see it here in in Macomb. Um, sometimes we have like little school gardens or kindergarten classes they raise monarchs just for like teaching about insect life cycles and they have their little monarch rearing cage in the classroom and this like insect 
just turns to goo. And mm, it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every once in a while, a fly pops out, and that's a parasitized one, but uh, that's yeah. a different, uh, that's just nature's, uh, you know, those way are the fun of being ones. Nature. Yeah, those, those are, those the, are fun the fun ones, ones right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, and I just thought of one. Um, when I'm driving around, like starting September time, I dread when I see this monarch butterfly creeping along the edge of the road, I'm like, no, no, don't you do it. Don't you do it. And then it like beelines across the road. I'm like, no. And I hit it with my car. Is that like a thing? Like yeah, mortality really, by car strikes? Mortality bark by car strikes is actually a pretty big source of mortality for them. It, it actually is. Uh, especially uh, down South when they're, they're overwintering, they, they actually do think that car mortality could play a role. Um, now, I, I don't think that, I think that's a little bit overstated. Uh, that's you know sort of my personal opinion. I, I think that car mortality is probably not as huge a factor as that habitat, um, as the habitat that we we're talking about. But uh, but it actually is something that the scientists are talking about being a uh, an issue. Certainly not helping anything. Yeah, it's not helping, right? Um, but you know, and don't I don't want folks to feel bad about you know finding a monarch caterpillar on their or. Uh, monarch butterfly on their grill. If they've got a caterpillar, it's because they've been driving where yeah. they shouldn't be driving. <laughs> yeah, you're, um, you, don't, you shouldn't go in that field. <laughs> but you know, you know, because it, it's it. Of course, it's an accident, and it's you know, it's not mm -hmm. your fault, right? Um, and guess. you know, you feel real bad about it, you plant a couple more milkweed stems out there, and you, I think you'll more make up for it. Well, Brody, speaking of feeling bad, there has been bad news about monarch populations. So uh, the IUCN, there's this press release has been out all over the place. It blew up my news feeds um, all up from social media to just like being on national news. The monarch butterfly being listed as an endangered species. Now, I haven't heard anything come from the United States federal government or US Fish and Wildlife Service or anything agency like that. What the heck just happened with the monarch butterfly in terms of being endangered? Right. Yeah. It, it, I, it blew up everybody's dashboard. And then um, yes. I, I even, and you guys both know this, of course, I had to co basically convene an emergency meeting so we could talk yep. about it mm -hmm. um, with, with, you know, with all the extension folks. Yeah. So the International Union for Conservation and Nature uh, declared monarchs to be endangered. And now that's different from the Endangered Species Act. Those are, those are two different lists maintained by two different uh, governing bodies. One's the federal government with the Endangered Species Act, and one is this, this you know, or this organization, the International Union of their Conservation and Nature. They're totally separate organizations. Um, you know, so what are the legal implications of an IUCN uh, listing? There are none. There are no, there's no legal impact from it, uh, but they do, it does matter, right? Like, so well, while it's not, uh, well, the endangered species list and the IUCN endangered list, and while they're not the uh, the same list, you know they don't have the same incidents. They have a lot of overlap, right? And you know when you click on Wikipedia and you look over in the right hand corner, and it says, you know, if you're looking at a, a cheetah, for instance, you you see that it says critically endangered. The IUCN that that's where they got that from, right? That's the database that Wikipedia uses. It, it is it matters that they've listed the the monarch as endangered. Uh, but just it, legally speaking, you know, I know a lot of farmers would, I would, my phone, I would still be on the phone if it was the Endangered Species Act listing, because I, I would be talking to every single farmer in Illinois about what to do about these caterpillars mm -hmm. that are, you know, how, how do I protect these endangered species that are literally everywhere? You, know, you can't, you can't look left or right in Illinois and not see, you know, a, a evidence of a monarch or evidence of monarch habitat, right? You know, milkweeds, there's been a huge reduction in their numbers. They're still pretty common. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it would be a huge deal if the Endangered Species listed it, Endangered Species Act listed it. Uh, but this is the International Union for the Conservation and Nature li list. So it's two different lists. So, and it, it, as you had mentioned, I think in that emergency meeting that you had convened, it's really not something that we want to see happen because if I had accidentally like stepped on a milkweed, I'd have to fill out paperwork. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's really an interesting issue because we have seen these big declines in monarchs, um, but listing it would have huge implications for a lot of people. It would have implications for 
construction. It would have implications for, for cities to have vacant lots. It would have implications, especially on farmers. You know, the agricultural land is a, is a big source of milkweed. It's milkweeds out there, um, you know, and it, it would be a big issue if these farmers were having to deal with the Endangered Species Act every day, right? Um, because monarchs, even though they've seen those huge declines, um, just like the milkweeds, they're still a little common, right? They're still mm -hmm. out there. You can still find them. When I'm doing surveys for I pollinate, you know, I, I have found a good number of I pollinate, or excuse me, of, of monarch caterpillars on these uh, milkweed plants that are in these gardens, right? So they're they're not they're not so rare that you're never going to see one. You know, it, it's pretty rare that you know, I, I'm going to see a cheetah, right? I, I, I'm probably never going to see a cheetah in the wild. I'm probably never going to see a panda in the wild. And I can guarantee you, I can walk out right now and I can go see a monarch. And it would be a big deal to have to fill out that paperwork every time you, for instance, we were talking earlier about, you know, you find one on your grill, yeah. or like, you know, uh, you know, lo and behold, you just violated the Endangered Species Act, right? So there are things that have to be thought through before a listing becomes um we'd have to we'd have to think really hard about listing it and what the implications of that would be yeah i i see the monarch butterfly as the symbol of north america it's from canada u.s mexico and it's like it's everywhere that would it, it would affect everybody yeah right and i, I think that iucm listing was just for the migratory ones right because there are correct. some in like south florida that are permanently staying correct, or, or correct. Florida that don't fly mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's some in Florida. I, I seem to recall that there's some uh, some in California, not many, but there's some in California that are non-migratory. I don't know if that makes a difference, but <laughs> I think most people think they're migratory and don't know about the non-migratory. Right, right. Um, so you guys have mentioned this emergency meeting, which I missed because I think I was weren't on you vacation. Oh, you weren't <laughs> oh, Ken was on vacation. Ken was in Florida with the non-migratory monarchs. Yeah. I think. Hanging out with yes. us. So I have no idea what happened, but I heard uh, that you shared, shared some uh, research on um, <clears throat> or talk about some published stuff that's been published saying that, you know, monarchs, butterflies are fine. Um, is that actually the case? Right. Yeah. We So just before, um, you know, this endangered species declaration came out, the monarchs were in the headlines with, you know, big, bold letters. Monarchs are thriving. Right. And, uh, you know, it, monarchs are very complex, right? You know, we have these, these data sets, th these data sets, they're showing declines. We have these data sets that are showing no change. And what had happened that, you know, all these uh, media organizations, these, you know, news places had caught on to is this study. And, and I, I think it's a publicly published study. So I, I can provide the, um, I can provide, I think I can provide the paper you can put in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there are some of these data sets that are showing declines and some that are sh not showing change. And in particular, this study had shown, had seen through the citizen science data, so all this community science data, that monarchs did not actually appear to be declining, uh, but in one, with one caveat, right? So they fully and readily admitted amongst those overwintering colonies, these monarchs are absolutely declining. The science is in, science has been done. We all have a consensus. Monarchs are declining year after year in those overwintering colonies. Uh, but when they looked at all the citizen science data, they are actually finding that, well, these monarchs seem to be doing pretty okay up here in the States. You know, and what they were talking about uh, when they say that monarchs are thriving in North America is that these butterflies really have an extraordinary res resilience. Uh, you know, they're able to rebound from what are these really big substantial population losses that they experience in that fourth generation, uh, you know, when they're, when they're down in their overwintering grounds and going down to their overwintering grounds. Uh, and they can take that tiny population and come spring pretty much repopulate the entirety of North America. Uh, you know, and so, so why is that? Uh, they speculate on a number of reasons. Climate change in this case might actually be helping them because you know it's a little warmer, a little cool, or excuse me, a little warmer and a little uh, a little more rain, a little more moisture in the Midwest where they're they're 
the you know their biggest population is, and that might actually be helping them uh, to you know to overcome some of these issues that that herbicide has caused them. You know this glyphosate issue that I was talking about earlier, um, and they they also think that maybe there might be some some competition, some co competitive pressure that's being relieved. Uh, you know there you know whereas before there might have been when this huge population was coming back up into the states, uh, you know on a given milkweed plant, there might be five butterflies laying eggs, right? Well, now there's only one butterfly laying eggs. And so maybe it, it is the case that uh, these, these individual caterpillars are actually doing better per plant, per milkweed plant. And so they, they have a little bit less competition, they're able to move around more, they're able to get more resources. Uh, and, you know, and, and the big thing is that, you know, uh, you know, they do sort of this cannibalism, right? So they, just like almost every insect, right? They, they, they'll do cannibalism if you put too many of them all together, right? And so there's, there's less of that going on because there's just fewer monarchs. So they're able to better utilize these resources as they're repopulating the states. So, you know, so to answer your question, you know, monarchs are okay for now, right? That's what it seems. Uh, it seems that they're able to handle these huge losses and that they've got a bit of this cushion, this resilience that they can work with. Uh, but the problem is that we have no clue where that cushion stops. We have no clue where that resilience might end. Uh, you know, and the authors say in the paper, uh, there is a point at which these butterflies are not going to be able to repopulate. And we don't know where that, pop that point is. Uh, and we know that this overwintering population is slowly dwindling. Uh, so we we just have to be aware of that, and we can't let our this is, this paper doesn't mean we can let our guard down. It just it's it's more nuanced to this data that we have on monarchs. That, that's interesting. So I've there's some points about monarchs where I'm like it's kind of a, a light bulb goes off, and it's, it's when someone had once told me like monarchs migrate not because they're like an Illinois species, they migrate because they're a tropical species, and I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And now you're saying climate change could help them like well they're a tropical species so that makes more sense then in terms of having a, a bit more of a leg up when we have a, a warmer start to spring and then the cool off for fall is a bit slower so um brody this is all coming together it's like a jigsaw in my head and then <laughs> you know i'll lay in bed at night and the jigsaw puzzle will get all torn up by my children so yeah <laughs> that's how it always goes so really interesting hmm. And, and that you know them being helped by climate change is, is speculation at this point. Yeah, uh, we're we're not totally sure about it, but um, you know they're working on it. That's information they're trying to get. And so the, okay, let me make sure I establish this too. Breeding population they hang out with us in Illinois during the summer, and then migratory population those are the ones headed down to Mexico fall, and. They they kind of return in the spring, but what they might make it to northern Mexico, south Texas, maybe. If I if I recall correctly, and can mm -hmm. please correct me on this one. So it's that fourth generation that's <laughs> that's migratory, and it goes down uh, into Mexico. I and I think it's a little bit of the third generation does this too, but it's mostly the fourth that's heading down into Mexico, and it's the offspring of that fourth generation that that ends up mm -hmm. coming back up uh, towards Illinois. Yeah, so that, yeah, those overwintering ones will, will migrate a little bit, lay eggs, and that those eggs or those offspring are what makes it to the Midwest. So I think that that migrating generation they live for what eight nine months, mm. whereas normally they're living for you know a month or two. Mm -hmm. They look pretty rough after those eight months too. <laughs> they're they're like oh yeah missing wings and yeah they're they're beaten up pretty bad. Oh yeah, absolutely. They're still beautiful, still beautiful, still beautiful, still beautiful. We don't want them to think any less of themselves. They've just had a, they've just had a long, a long, hard life. <laughs> yes, they have. They have. It's they've flown more miles than are currently on. Like there are cars out there that have fewer miles on them than some of these, you know, butterfly. Yeah, they're putting how many miles are on those wings? Like three thousand miles, four thousand. And they're fighting birds. They're fighting all kinds of things that yeah want to take a little nibble off of them. So it, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, it. it so when we talk about solutions, you know, when it comes to um, monarch butterflies, let's talk about something that might have become a bit more controversial as of late. I think when I 
uh, started into this whole monarch gig. Everyone's like, ah, you got to break, take the monarch caterpillars into your house and rear them because it's something I don't remember the statistic, but it's a very low statistic of caterpillars that actually make it to become an adult butterfly. Um, they're like, well, let's give them a, let's give them a boost. Let's take them inside and rear them indoors. Um, so that Brody, seems does so this, logical, doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it? This is what we do to our children. I mean, I used to just keep them in the backyard and then my wife said, let's bring them inside. And so they're, they're much healthier now. Um, but is this going to save monarch butterflies if we bring them inside? Yeah. I mean, so bringing them inside is the standard protocol for every endangered species out there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, we, we get a, you know, it's hard to walk around and and not get it's it's hard to navigate your life and not get a news story in your feed somewhere about a panda being born in captivity. Yes. And yes. In fact, I got one this morning, right? Uh -huh. So oh, yeah, I'm sure it, I got the. Uh, I need a check so I can. Yeah, that exactly. Out. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and it's fine. I was looking for the panda. I I, I want to know these pandas' names, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they they haven't named them yet, so we we, we have to wait on the on the names. But I'll you know, the this is standard on here. Yeah, you know, so. That standard operating procedure for every animal that we know of that's endangered, right? We got to bring it inside. We're gonna we're gonna protect them. We're gonna hug them. We're gonna make sure they've got food. We're gonna make sure they have all their needs met, and we're gonna send them out in the wild, right? And uh, you know, really, in the last couple of years, we've found out that we can't do that with uh, with monarchs, or we we shouldn't do that with monarchs. Um, you know it's just become increasingly clear that monarchs raised indoors are not as capable as their, their outdoor um, friends, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's, uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, one is disease, and we mentioned disease earlier. Uh, this o OE, monarchs get hit really hard by it, uh, but it, outdoors, but indoors, it's, it's a whole nother question. It's a whole nother ball game. You know, it's it's difficult even for labs who are trained in sterilizing, you know, and keeping a nice sterile environment for these monarchs. It's difficult for those labs to keep OE break outbreaks in check, and it's extremely difficult for a, just a person, you know, just a, you know, a person raising monarchs in their kitchen to do. Very difficult to keep OE, you know, out of a a, a re, any reasonably sized uh, monarch breeding population that you've got going. Um, but also there's another reason, which is that, you know, the, these monarchs that are raised indoors, we, we take them outside and science, uh, scientific studies have shown that once they're raised indoors, it's almost like they, they lose track of, of where they are in the world. They have no clue where they are or what they're doing. You know, the, you'll release hundred butterflies, maybe 20 of them fly south and then another 20, well, they fly due east. And the rest of them, well, they'll fly kind of southeast, right? And you know it, that's not great, right? Because they, they have to use they use a lot of resources to try to migrate. And, you know, and even worse, what the, more studies have found that these indoor reared um, cat, uh, monarchs are less less capable in terms of flight strength. So they they are not as strong flapping their wings. They can't flap their wings as long. Some studies have even found that they have uh, worse coloration. So they, they, they're not as physically attractive uh, to, you know, like the males aren't as physically attracted to the females. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's horrible, really. You know, it, it's really unfortunate because we, we have this tool that we've become really good at, and, you know, as a species, you know, as humanity. We've gotten really good at being able to take and save a species just by bringing it inside and watching it and keeping an eye on it. It sort of it, pl it plays to our strengths. You know, we're so good at at stewarding things, at this at animal husbandry. We're really good at it, and it's the the monarch butterflies. They they just for some reason we don't know all the reasons. Some reason they they don't respond well to it. So, Brody, it's like you're saying us humans we're trying to circumvent the the natural selection process here of. Uh, maybe they weren't supposed to make it to begin with is that I, like only the strong survive right yeah i mean that's a little bit part of it actually you know these uh i think you had mentioned earlier that you know these monarchs have a really low survival rate you know they'll lay 100 eggs and maybe only two of them will become adults mm -hmm. and we thought oh well that well that's great because we can just have one monarch 
and have a bunch of monarchs come out of that one monarch laying eggs. The problem is that maybe some of those eggs really, that they, they aren't supposed to make it. Maybe they are, the runts aren't supposed to, of, that, of that particular litter. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the, the sort of group name for a, a cluster <laughs> of eggs is yes. uh, for monarchs. I don't know. But, you know <laughs> the runt of those litters like really aren't supposed to make it. And it might be the case that by bringing all of these to adulthood, we're actually making the, uh, the population a little weaker. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we have such an affinity for runts and the, yeah. you know, the, the person struggling, the, yeah. Oh, Absolutely. Man. The Nature underdog care. every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nature doesn't care. So Ken, from now on, <clears throat> before we have our kids do video games, 50 push-ups, 50 sit-ups, right? <laughs> <laughs> like they got to work for it. Run a mile. <laughs> run a mile. You got to run around the house 20 times, kids. Yeah. Exactly. So got to be, got to be strong. No, no. Na these are humans. These are humans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nature doesn't care. It's trying to kill you. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right, so since maybe rearing isn't the best choice for increasing populations, and I would say, you know, if, if you want to raise one or two with your kids, that's fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, your yeah. mass rearing. So, so, so here's the that. thing, you know, raising, the, the big thing is you shouldn't be raising a thousand caterpillars. Like, don't, don't be raising a thousand monarchs because it's not, it's probably not good for them, right? At the very least, it's not doing good. It's not doing good for them. And it may, at, at worst case, it may actually hurt them, right? But if you're rearing uh, caterpillars to show kids how butterflies work, you should absolutely still be doing that. Um, you know, education is so important in teaching kids. Uh, if you teach a kid about a monarch caterpillar and they love that caterpillar, congratulations, you've just made a new scientist, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's incredibly valuable, having those kids with that knowledge. Um, but, you know, the, like I said, the big issue is these big breeding operations that are, that are raising hundreds, if not thousands. A couple, a couple here and there in your backyard showing your kids how to, that's not a problem whatsoever. Since we shouldn't be doing this kind of wide scale, what are, what are some things that we can do to kind of give us that satisfaction that we've helped monarchs? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, making sure monarchs have milkweeds is a great priority. Um, I keep harping on this, but they, it's an obligate relationship. They must have milkweed in order to survive as a, as a species. And even though milkweed is pretty common, it's not as common as it used to be, and it's probably not as common as they need it to be. So having milkweed out there is is good, and it's a, it's a good thing that you can feel but feel really good about if you are able to put that in your garden. Um, and especially swamp milkweed because it just looks good anyway. I love I love swamp milkweed. It's great. Oh yeah, yeah. We're getting a thumbs up from Chris. So I, um, it's also about that those nectar resources. You know, these monarchs are you know. As that paper, uh, the monarch, monarchs are thriving paper was discussing, you know, it, it could be that these, this, there's this vital period for monarchs, and it's the migration period where they're seeing these huge losses. Well, why would they be experiencing losses? It's probably because they don't have enough nectar resources, you know, because they're already they're already existing. They're already, you know, they're they're no longer caterpillars. It may it may not be the uh, access to milkweed in this particular uh, part of their life cycle, it could be that just they don't have enough food, they don't have enough nectar in, able, in, it, in order to make it. So having things like monarch way stations, uh, being able to have a garden that has a, a sweep of, of uh, nectar availability throughout the year, you know, and especially at that fall period, that's a great way to make sure that these butterflies have the resources they, that they need in order to, in order to survive. And this would help other pollinators too, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, pollinators are seeing across the board, butterflies, bees, what have you. They're all seeing huge declines. And, uh, you know, it, it's all about, you know, in one part habitat, but also nectar resources. There's just less out there. When everything all around you is grass, uh, when all everything all around you is corn and you're not a human, or, uh, or, I, or I suppose also a cow, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's nothing for you to eat. You know, there's got to be this source of weeds and uh, source of flowers. And I, I was actually just in a, a seminar. Uh, it was given by the Entomological Society of America on biodiversity loss. And in that seminar, uh, Dr. May Barenbaum, who is the uh, head of the Department of Entomology, had, had an awesome thing sort of as a recommendation to folks who are doing 
uh, outreach and, and sort of thinking about biodiversity loss. And she said, maybe the thing that we can do is talk to folks about how, you know, we, we know it's hard to put in these gardens. That's a lot of work. Um, it, it's hard to go out and, and volunteer your time to do all these things. What about do no harm? First, do no harm. And I think that's a pretty, uh, that, that's, a, that's a really awesome idea. It really changed how I think about things because there's so many things that we do that we don't need to do. And by not doing those things, maybe we could help pollinators a little bit. You know, so for, so a farmer, for a farmer, that might look like, you know, do I need to mow this, uh, this waterway? Do I need to mow it right now? You know, it's, it's a little tall. I don't usually like, you know, maybe I can leave these milkweeds out. Maybe I can leave some of these flowering plants out for these pollinators. Uh, you know, for a city, maybe it's something really similar where, you know, they're used to mowing their, uh, their roadsides every, you know, every month, right? Maybe they can, they can cut back down on that mowing. But yeah, first do no harm is, is a great aspiration for, for some of that. I really, I like that. That was my, my take when I, I teach invasive species control plant species um, for the most part. And at the end of my presentation, it was a similar thing. It's like, you know, what can we do? Well, step one, you know, do no harm. And, and I said, I don't want to be a contributor. And so it's like, I ripped out my burning bush you know, that has been escaping into the woods nearby and it's non-native at pushing out native species. And so I, that's, that's a perfect way to, to frame that as a big first step of a, of a solution process and do no harm. I love that. Uh, Dr. Barabom, way to go. Yeah, <laughs> good job. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Brody, we have picked your brain quite a bit on monarch butterflies, but I do want to ask you a, a little bit about the iPollinate project, which you you helped to coordinate. Um, so this is a couple citizen science projects. Could you maybe uh, just real quick a synopsis of these? And then is this citizen science? So anyone can do this, correct? Right. Yeah. So iPollinate is a community science project in, in three parts. Uh, anybody can participate. Uh, all it requires is a bit of gardening and uh, some time on the, I think it's the third week of every month uh, during, the, you know, during the growing season, you know, during the summer and the uh, spring, summer, and a little bit in the fall. Uh, but the, you know, the first and second part are usually done in conjunction with one another. Uh, and they involve putting in a garden with a set list of plants. And the garden can be in any shape. It can even be in pots if you don't have enough yard space. Uh, and you survey that, that little garden once a month, uh, you know, on this third week. And it, this first part is providing data for an experiment that's currently being run by Dr. Alexandra Harmon III. Uh, and it's looking into pollinator attraction to some of these common ornamental annual plants, things that you might you would find at a, at a garden center, marigold, salvia, portaluca, and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, set the second part, is providing data for Dr. David Zaya. And you plant, part of that list of plants has four milkweeds on it. And you, you put these plants in, you survey them once a month for monarch eggs and monarch caterpillars. And that's gonna tell, that's gonna tell him about monarch response to garden variability. This is a part of this thing. You fill out a piece of paper that basically says, well, these are the top five plants in my garden that are the most attractive to, to pollinators, I, I see the most pollinators here and how many flowers are on that plant. And he's able to take that data and look and see how monarchs respond to it. And, and then of course we have bee spotter, uh, which you know you, you it don't necessarily have to do it in conjunction with those first two projects. You can, you know, you'd go out and as part of bee spotter, you take your phone, take your camera. And if you see a really awesome bumblebee uh, that you wanna take a picture of, take a picture of it, Submit it to Bee Spotter, and they'll ID that bee for you. And they also provide resources in case you want to ID the bee, but you can submit it. A scientist will uh, will verify that um, that identification, and they'll include it into their this big database that they have of where of where these bees are. Uh, and I think it's it's bumblebees and honeybees that they're that they're focused on. Well, I, the the citizen or the better term really is community science projects. Um, I mean, these are very invaluable, as you had mentioned, Brody, to scientists. 
whether it's that specific project, but it's data, data is data and data can be pulled and used in different ways and in different projects. And so it's super valuable. So we're gonna leave a link below in the show description uh, for the iPollinate uh, Community Science Projects. Brody, I can't leave without asking you this last question. And I didn't tell you beforehand, but what's your favorite insect or maybe grouping of insects? Do you have one? So I knew you were gonna ask that. Yeah, I totally knew everyone it. knows, everyone knows. So I, I'm, I'm, I tell you, what, I'm not gonna tell you what my favorite insect is because it changes okay. day to day. But I will mm -hmm. tell you what my favorite butterfly is because mm -hmm. it's not the monarch, mm -hmm. it's the viceroy. I love the Viceroy. And for folks that don't know, the Viceroy looks almost identical to a monarch yeah. caterpillar. Mm -hmm. and, and I find it very uh, compelling that there's the, it's a little bit smaller and, and it's got a little bit different coloration, but I find it very compelling that these two species have converged on this monarch identity, this very, this monarch look in order to get predators to not eat it. I think that's so awesome. And the reason the Viceroy is my favorite of the two is because the Monarch gets so much attention and the Viceroy, <laughs> nobody knows who the Viceroy is. So I guess I've got to plug it a little bit. And it is interesting. We used to think that the Viceroy was just a mimic and that it, it didn't have any traits that would make it indigestible or you know, unattractive to predators. But we found out fairly recently that no, they're just as you know, sort of uneatable, un, 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 you know, bad for these, mm -hmm. these predators as the monarchs are. So they're, they're also toxic. They also have these traits. I just think it's super cool that they converge on that, that monarch looking identity. So we're talking two evolutionary paths, two separate ones converging. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. That's neat. I love that. Well, um, Brody, Thank you very much for being on the show today. We learned a lot about monarchs. Um, I, I think it's really important when we have something as, as widespread as, as like monarch butterflies and how much they're in the news and how much people talk about them, how much people care about them, to be reminded of that science behind it all, um, you know, trying to correct and steer the ship, you know, even though we maybe want to go this way and rear them in our house. Is that the best thing? Well, today we've learned probably not. So, um, but yes, please still use them as teaching tools. Brody, thank you so much uh, for being on the show today. And thank you, Chris. And thank you, Ken, for having me. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension and uh, edited this week by me, I think. Right, Ken? Okay, it's it edited by you. me. Uh, <laughs> um, well, a special thank you to Ken Johnson for also being here with us today. Thank you, Ken. Yes, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Brody, for the monarch information. We'll have to have you back for our next pollinator discussion. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We'll, we'll check those overwintering numbers, even though it might not correspond to the breeding population that hangs out with us in Illinois. Now we know. We've, we've learned a lot today. So, I want to yeah. say one thing to your viewers, mm -hmm. which is that if you want to be involved, citizen science is how we find out all these things that we need to know about. Uh, monarchs, you know that paper that I was that we were discussing, citizen science. Uh, if you want to be involved in it and make a big impact, being involved in some kind of citizen citizen science project, uh, community science project is one of the best ways to do so. So please, you know, if whether or not it's I pollinate, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be I pollinate, but please consider being a part of some of these uh, monitoring uh, scientific uh, um, initiatives. Uh, to, to make a big difference. But yeah, thank you. Definitely. Yeah, we, we need you because we don't have enough roadies to go around. We need more entomologists. <laughs> and so Ken and yeah. I were trying to train our children to be like, you know, some parents tape baseballs to the left hand of their kid while they sleep. We're, we're putting spiders and things on our, our children's <laughs> hands. So we're not yeah. that mean. We're nice parents. Really, we are. We are. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank, yeah. you, bro. thank you and chris let's do this again next week oh we shall do this again next week we're going to be talking with horticulture educator emily zweihart all about trees uh so you won't want to miss that uh show as we get into fall prime time for fall color maybe planting some trees we're also getting into winter where trees are gonna maybe struggle we got ice we got snow coming our way so folks listeners thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening or if you're watching us on youtube watching and as always keep on growing <laughs>